passage for today, which is verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. So today we're talking about being a peacemaker. And what does that mean? And each week, same exact thing. What am I going to tell you right now? There's a what part and a what part? An A part and a B part, right? In each of these verses, there's an A part and a B part, kind of what we're pursuing and the promise that comes with it, okay? The, what you're pursuing and what happens when you pursue it. Uh, and so we're just, this, this is the exact same thing every week. And you might be getting bored. We're almost done if you're bored. But anyway, I'm really enjoying this. Uh, I, I've been loving studying this stuff. And so for me, this has been really fun. But the A part is peacemakers. Blessed are the what? The peacemakers. And then the B part is they'll be called sons of God. And we're not just talking about men, okay? It's actually children of God or whatever, sons and daughters, whatever. We'll get there when we begin to talk about that. But every week I ask you this question, what does it mean to be a, whatever he says, poor in spirit, more in general, what does it mean to be a peacemaker? Let's talk about that, interact, out of your brain, just off the top of your head, what does it mean to be a peacemaker? How would you define a peacemaker? Resolve to resolve conflict, that's good. A mediator, good. Anyone else? Keeping people happy, okay, cool. Peacemaker, reconciler. Okay, yeah. Don't escalate an argument, okay, or instigate an argument, sure. It's not something we think about a lot, probably, right? Unless you're in a home that's like crazy, always arguing, and you're the peacemaker, you probably think about it. But, you know, it's, it's not one of the things that we hear a lot about in Scripture. It's not something that preachers preach a lot about, about being a peacemaker, but we're going to talk about that today, what it means to be a peacemaker. And I know some of you guys, you saw peacemaker and you're so excited. You thought we're talking about weapons, right? You thought we're talking about the, what is it? The eight, I wrote it down, 1873 single action cult peacemaker, right? How many of you thought yes, right? Oh, one person, a couple of you. We're not talking about that, okay? We're talking about what, what it means. Actually, all of you guys, I mean, together, you really did very good of defining what this idea of being a peacemaker is. It's a noun, I, I wrote it up here, hopefully. It's a noun, okay, it's a, it's a person, right? It's a person who brings about peace, especially by reconciling, that's what uh, Kylie said, reconciling adversaries, people that are at each other's throats, okay? And not necessarily, a lot of uh, the adversaries are, is kind of maybe a strong word. People that just have beef with each other and, and just because um, there's beef in a situation doesn't necessarily mean you're an adversary. So it's someone who brings peace or unity or accord or whatever the word is that you want to share there between two people or groups. I mean, it can be between a husband and wife, a boyfriend and girlfriend, a, 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 a parent and a child. It can be a peacemaker can bring, bring peace between two organizations or two nations even. So it's groups of people or people themselves being brought together to resolve a conflict, okay? Um, that there would no longer be this strife or this, um, this conflict between them. And this series, if you think about it, really, really builds on each other. All of these steps, they keep stepping on each other. And this thing really is, is based on being a peacemaker is really based on a lot of these things that we've already talked about. In order to be a peacemaker, you got to be pure in heart, okay? Um, in order to be a peacemaker, you need to go in gently and humbly. And so a lot of these things, we're, we're going to, they're going to repeat themselves. And if you, we talked about this idea of pursuing, right, hungering and thirsting after righteousness and pursuing righteousness, which, which is to be like Jesus, okay? We talked about sanctification and justification and that we're to try to become more and more like Jesus if we can and do everything that we can to do that. Well, Jesus was a peacemaker. He was the ultimate peacemaker. I mean, if you think about it, look at James 3.18. It says this, and this is a very similar verse to our, our, our text here today. It says, and those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of what? Righteousness. So again, these, these things are connected. The, a peacemaker is on their way to becoming righteous, on their way to becoming more and more like Jesus because Jesus was the ultimate peacemaker for us. Okay? And that's part, of our, um, that's part of our plan. 
that we would become, we talked about this a few weeks ago, we would become more and more like Jesus. That sanctification, us doing things like he did, uh, saying things like he did, acting like he did, making decisions like he did, because he was our example. And so peacemaking is just one of those things that he did that also we need to be doing as well. You see, Jesus came to establish peace between God and man. And we've talked about this a lot, but the, the reality is that we were made, Adam and Eve were created perfectly, but what, come, what came into the situation? Temptation and sin, right? And because of that temptation and sin, where they at once had a great relationship with God, this great connection, this perfect unity with God, that unity was broken. And sin came in and it messed everything up. And so now there is no longer, there was no, after that, there was no longer peace between God and man. And all of a sudden there's all these rules and people are dying and all of these things, crazy consequences of sin. And God says, I want to make peace with man. And I'm going to do it through my son who's going to die on the cross. He's going to pay the price for each individual in here today people that you know, the people that you don't know, he died and paid the price for them so that way peace could be made between God and them. And he was our ultimate peacemaker. We covered this concept that Jesus was the peacemaker in our Ephesians series. And I'm going to kind of go back to our Ephesians series quite a bit. I'm just looking around. How many of were here for our Ephesians series? About half of you were here for that. We did that like two years ago. Our Ephesians series talked about, I mean, if you want to get into who Jesus is and what he's done for us, read the beginning of Ephesians. It's crazy. So look at, look at verse, um, verse 14 of chapter 2 in Ephesians. I think I, I do have it up on the screen. It says this. It says, for Christ himself has brought what to us? Peace. Okay, and just a few verses later. Now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. He became peace our peacemaker he was our peacemaker and so if we're pursuing righteousness hungering and thirsting for righteousness right talk about it a few weeks ago meaning trying to become like jesus more and more like him and if he was a peacemaker then that means what we need to be peacemakers something that we're called to do called to be like him so as i looked at it this week i kind of looked at peacemaking and there's probably a lot of other areas of peacemaking but these are the three that i want to talk about today the three kind of responsibilities of a peacemaker what does it mean to be a peacemaker if i'm supposed to go do it where do i do it how do i do it with whom do i do it we're going to answer those questions there's three areas and those three areas are up on the screen uh, we need to be sharing the gospel okay we need to be uh, p making peace with our enemies and then we need to also be peacemakers in situations where maybe we're not even involved as a third party, okay? And so those are the three areas we're going to look at this morning. And, and the first one is to share the gospel, okay? We're called to share the gospel. Now listen to this. I, I'm saying this very specifically. I want you to hear me. We're called to help bring peace between man and God. God already brought peace. He already established peace between himself and mankind. But it's also now our responsibility to share the gospel and allow people to understand that there is no longer peace between them and God. That there is this beef, this sin problem, and it's our responsibility to help establish peace now between man and God. God's done his part. He did his part through Jesus 2,000 some years ago. But now we need to help men and women around us, boys and girls around us, understand that they also need to accept that gift of peace, right? That there's some responsibility on each person. They need to say, I receive that gift of salvation. And so that's what sharing the gospel is. It's help making peace with man, men around you, women around you, boys and girls around you, all of your neighbors, your coworkers, all of those people that you have influence with one of our primary uh, positions, primary obje uh, objectives in pe making peace with people is to help them see that they need to make peace with God. They need to receive that gift of salvation. 
And so that's sharing the gospel. That's doing what we're supposed to be doing. Man needs to respond to that. Back in our Ephesians series, we talked about the armor of God. Do you remember that? We, we talked about all those things, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness. This is the slide from that series. You get down about halfway there and you say, you see the shoes of peace. That we talked about daily praying on the shoes of peace, and we called them because it was armor. We called them the boots of the gospel, right? That, that, that we need to put on the boots of the gospel, meaning taking the gospel, you put on boots in order to do what? To go march, right? To go engage people. And then we need to do that daily. Pray on and say, God, help me today to find a way to share the gospel with someone. With that dude that sits next to me that eats that really stinky food at lunch and destroys the bath. You know, that guy or whoever it is, right? There's a person in your life for sure that needs to hear the gospel, okay? And it may be the person that, oh, you don't want to talk to. Or it may be the person that you've been talking to for months or years and they still have not responded. Part of our responsibility as peacemakers is to share that gospel with them, to put on those boots of the gospel and walk out and talk about Jesus and what he's done for us, okay? So we need to get moving. Ephesians 6.15 says this, For shoes put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you'll be fully prepared. That was part of the spiritual armor that we put on. So a key part of peacemaking is helping people understand that they need peace between them and God. A lot of people think, I'm fine. I'm a good person. If you ask them, so many people, would you say you're a good person? Most people are going to say, what? Yeah, I do okay, right? I do a little bit more good than bad so that I'm okay with God, surely. Well, that's not true. If you read the Bible, that is absolutely not true. God doesn't have these scales up there and he's watching you and you do a little bit more good. Okay, he's good with me today. Oh no, he's now bad. He's in heaven. Now he's out. That's not how it works, okay? Jesus established peace through his death, burial, and resurrection. And we need to respond to that gift and then we get that peace. So that's the first thing we need to do is share the gospel. That's the first area of peacemaking. The second area is to, is to share and make peace with the people that we've got beef with okay and maybe it's not necessarily your enemies but the personal problems that you have in your life with people part of peacemaking is dealing with those situations okay is going to them and saying hey listen let, let's make up let's figure this out let's let's make peace with those who are opposing us that's the second part of peacemaking surely you have someone in your life that there's a little bit of beef with. And some of you are like, man, I got 50. What are you talking about, right? Like, so there, there's someone in your life that there's, there has, there's been a conflict. Maybe it was years ago and there's no resolution. And you see them in Walmart and you see them down the aisle and you're like, scooting, you're like, whoa, I'm getting way over here. You don't want to see them. You know, some of you are laughing because you do that, right? You, you try not to make eye contact with them. You try to make them think you didn't see them or whatever. There, there needs to be peace. If you're ever running away from someone in Walmart, you need to be a peacemaker there, right? That's a pretty good gauge. Um, and Walmart's a great place because you're going to see everyone you know at Walmart, right? So um, you think I got stock in that place. I bought stuff there this morning. I'm talking about it. I, I, anyway, it's just right there. But we need to be peacemakers. This is probably the most obvious thing when you, when you read this text on what we're supposed to do. We need to go the extra mile to make sure that this verse comes true, Romans 12:18 that if possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. This is what Paul says to us. He's, he's saying, listen, be at peace with all men. If you can, do what you can. Look at Hebrews 12. It says this. It says, pursue peace with all men and the sanctification, talked about that already, right? Becoming more and more like Jesus. The sanctification and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. Here it's pretty strong. It's saying if you're not at peace with men, Listen, you got a problem, okay? You need to seriously consider if you've got a bunch of enemies that you're just willing to, you know, say whatever. That's their life, whatever. No. God's saying you need to make peace with them. Do what you can to make peace with them. So maybe there's some people you've got beef with. Could be your kid. Could be your, my grandma just walked in. It could be your grandma, right? I don't have beef, I don't have beef with my grandma, but it could be. It could be a coworker. 
Or that neighbor that's throwing the dog poop over the fence. You know, you know that guy? You know that guy? Everyone has that guy. Well, maybe not, but you know what I mean. Like there's someone, surely, that you're called to make peace with in your life. And this series builds and it builds and it builds. And again, if we're going to be merciful, like we talked about like three weeks ago, then that means forgiving the unforgivable, right? Remember those people we talked about, the unforgivable? They don't really deserve our forgiveness. This is a perfect example of peacemaking with people. Maybe it's going to cost you something, okay? Making peace with people is certainly going to cost us something. It's going to take a sacrifice on our part. That person that you're running away from Walmart in, it's going to be an uncomfortable conversation probably, okay? You may have to sacrifice some of your pride. You may have to, if you're like me, you may have to sacrifice being right. Because a lot of times, right, like there's someone that's in your, in your past, you've got beef with them, and you're right. You know you're right, right? And they're like, well, I'm right, I know I'm right, and you both think you're right. Someone's going to have to sacrifice being right, okay, to make peace in that situation. There's going to have to be some kind of sacrifice in order to make peace in so many situations. And the reality is, why would there not be, right? Because God made peace through blood. The only way that there was peace made between God and man was through blood. And so, of course, there's probably going to be some time that you're going to have to sacrifice or some pride, some energy, some, you know, whatever. There's going to maybe have to be a sacrifice on your part. William Barclay was a very famous theologian. He said this about um, these texts here about making peace and it says, the peace which the Bible calls blessed does not come from the evasion of issues. So that's, he's saying, that it's not about not dealing with it, okay? It's not about hiding from the person in Walmart. Okay? That's what he's saying here. It comes from facing the person at Walmart, right? And maybe not Walmart's the best place to make peace because you'd probably be on the internet throwing stuff, you know, or whatever. Um, but dealing with them and conquering them, not the people, but the issues, what this beatitude demands is not the passive acceptance of things because we're afraid of the trouble of doing anything about them, but the active facing of things and the making of peace even when the way to peace is through struggle. Does that make sense to you? I love how he says it here that, that we're going to have to face the problem and it's probably going to be a struggle. It's... It, it's, we've got to address the issue, okay? We've got to address the issue. But when you address it, rely on these previous beatitudes to help you address it. We talked about being gentle. If you go in trying to make peace with someone with this rage, you ain't gonna make peace, you're gonna just make a greater enemy, right? If you realize, if you humbly go in and realize your sin and your mistakes and all of those things, you're gonna go into peacemaking way different saying, I don't have it all together. I know I've made mistakes, okay? If you go into that peacemaking situation mercifully, which we've talked about, saying, I'm going to put myself in their position. I'm going to try to see, them, see the situation from their perspective. We need, that's what I'm saying. This series builds and it builds and it builds. Peacemaking is all about being all of these things we've already talked about for the past few months. In the middle of trying to address the problem, Jesus never says, you can just go forget about it, right, or whatever. You know, he doesn't say that. He doesn't say just, just brush it on the carpet, just forget about it, don't worry about it, don't look at them, ignore them. That's not what peacemaking is. And a lot of us think peacemaking is just ignoring it and not bringing up the issue and just letting the person continue to be a turd to you or whatever, right? It's like you just think that it's just this ignoring it. That's not what this text is about. It's about addressing it. And is it going to be uncomfortable? Sure. It may cost you something, which we just talked about. But we need to, before we go into that, we need to pray. And say, God, make me gentle in this conversation. Make me humble. Make me merciful. Give me a pure heart here, God. Give me their perspective. Give me your perspective, God. And then address them, okay? And go after it and see what might happen. The third area uh, that we're supposed to be a peacemaker is in bad situations, okay? And this is just like when you see conflict going on around you, maybe it has nothing to do with you, 
Um, maybe it's between a, whatever, someone else. We're also called as Christians to be peacemakers in outside situations, in, in situations that need our assistance, where people just can't get along. We're called to help them figure those things out as peacemakers, to make two parties um, come together as an outside third person. Now, I'm going to go Old Testament on you, and some of you are like, whoa, crazy. Okay, we're going to look at this story. Sorry, we're going to look at this story. If you've got your Bibles, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 25, because it's a really long story, and I'm not going to um, read it all, but you can follow along with me in your Bible. Um, this is a kind of a crazy story, and I don't know if you've heard it, if you've ever, if you've read the Bible, certainly you've read it, um, but maybe you're not so familiar with it. Everyone knows King David, right? You all know David. Any of you ever heard of Nabal? One of you, two of you that have gone to seminary. You probably should have, right? A few of you have, maybe. Any of you ever know Abigail? Well, you know some Abigails in life, right? Lots of, lots of people named Abigail. And it's good because Abigail in this story, she's legit, okay? She's a peacemaker. We've got King David, who we know well, okay? David's shepherd boy, right? He gets anointed. He's going to become king. He becomes king. He's crazy. And then they got the Bathsheba incidents. All these stories in the Bible about David. Well, no, David's out and he's being chased by Saul. At this point in the story, David is on the run. If you remember, the, the, the prophet had come and anointed David as new king of Israel. And the current king of Israel, Saul, he, was, he had beef. Because any king who knows that someone else is going to come after them, he ain't cool with it in the Bible. Most of them are not cool with it and they try to kill the other person. Okay, so Saul's chasing David. And Saul's a lunatic, okay? It's just reality. Saul's a lunatic. Um, David was his son's best friend. David served him constantly and all this, but Saul was ready to kill him. He was trying to find him. And David had assembled a bunch of men, basically all the misfits, okay, that didn't fit in anywhere. Those were David's men. And they were out in the desert. They were out in the desert of, I can't remember the name of the place, Nan, or what does it say there? Um, they were in... Okay, the wilderness of Palestine. They were in this place. I guess it doesn't really matter. Yeah, M-A-O-N, Campton Mayon. Okay, and not that that really matters, but in this place in Mayon lived this guy named Nabal. Okay, and Nabal was an idiot. Okay, the, verse 3, you'll see there it says, He was harsh and evil in his dealings, but he was rich. He had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. And of course, in order to herd 4,000 little animals, he needed a bunch of what? Shepherds. And they would, they would take care of the sheep and the goats out in the desert. Well, this is near where David and his men were. And so they weren't raided, okay? David and his men protected the shepherds and the sheep while they were out there. David and his men never took a sheep, which would have been very common to just go and take a few for food or whatever kind of as payment for protecting them. They never hurt them. They never injured them. They were never raided. And so it comes time, all of a sudden it comes time for the sheep shearing. And this would be like for us a big party. It's like your birthday party, okay? What do you do? Throw out all the stops, okay? We're going to get a DJ and we're going to get a cake. And we're gonna... That's basically like sheep shearing. Sheep shearing was a time where they would come and they would shear the sheep and they would have a big feast, big festival, well, David hears, David and his men hear that Nabal is about to do the sheep shearing. And so David sends some men to Nabal and he says, hey, the men go to Nabal and Nabal's an idiot, okay? And uh, they say, we've been out in the desert protecting your shepherds and protecting your sheep. And we would love if you would give us some leftovers, basically. You know, they basically go to the party and they say, hey, can, can you invite us? We're out in the desert. We got nothing to eat, you know? We've been protecting you. We've been taking care of your men. Can we get a little bit? And you know what Nabal says? Nah, get out of my face. No. He, he, said, he sends them off with nothing. So they go back to King David. Well, he's not king yet. They go back to David. And David says, what? He does what? He says, get your swords, boy. There's blood tonight. And they go after Nabal. And they start to take off, and they're going to kill Nabal and his whole family. Everyone in that family, they're going to kill, okay? They're going to get revenge for him being such a jerk to them. Well, in comes Abigail. 
Abigail is Nabal's wife. And verse 3 says that she was intelligent and beautiful in appearance. So she was a cutie with a brain, which is kind of hard to come by. You either got a cutie or you got a brain. Sometimes, sometimes you get both. That's cool. Okay. But Abigail hears what her idiot husband has done. Okay. She hears about what her idiot husband has done. And she says, oh, no, we know who David is. We know he's not going to be cool with this. And he's going to be coming after us. So she loads up her SUV full of Twinkies and soda pop and all that stuff, right? She gets all these supplies and heads off to try to intercept David because she knows he's coming. He's coming for blood. And she intercepts him with all of these supplies. Where they, had, they had slaughtered a few of the sheep and she gives them food and resources and all these things. And she jumps down off of her horse and bows down to David and says, I'm sorry, it's my fault. It's my fault. I take the blame. My idiot husband back there should not have done what he did. He doesn't speak for us, right? Like she's making peace in the situation, okay? That wasn't, be it was between David and Nabal, not her. She saw a situation that needed peace and she took some action. She brings all of this stuff. She says, listen, forgive us. Allow us Allow us some grace here, okay? And what does David do? Most of us would have just, you know, right by her and just kept on going and slaughtered everyone. And then this is, this is the response. We're going to look at verse 20 of, of chapter 25, verse 32, just really quickly. I love this. So the Abigail, the peacemaker, has just addressed David. And she's like, listen, don't kill him. God will take care of him. Okay, and this is what she says, or this is what David says. Then David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel who sent you this day to me. Immediately, David understands that God sends a Abigail as a peacemaker. Okay? He, he didn't see her as just this average, smart, cute woman, which we'll talk about later. Okay? He sees her as a godsend, as a peacemaker. Get out what he says. And blessed be your discernment. Okay? God was working in her life, showing her what she needed to do. And blessed be you, for you have kept me this day from bloodshed and from avenging myself by my own hand. He's saying, listen, you kept me from sinning. You kept me from destroying my any chance at being king. Thank you so much. He's thanking her. He's thanking God and he's thanking her for being a peacemaker. It continues. It says, nevertheless, check this out. Nevertheless, as the Lord God of Israel lives, who has restrained me from harming you, unless you had come quickly to meet me, surely there would not have been left to Nabal until the morning light as much as one male. He said, if you hadn't come, I'd have killed everybody. That's what he's saying there. So David received from her hand what she had brought to him. So he took the gifts, right? And he said, to your house in peace. I love that, in peace. She was a peace maker go up to your house in peace see i have listened to you and granted your request abigail was a peacemaker and saves many probably hundreds from the sword okay saves them from death she saw a bad situation that was not between her and someone else it was between two other people she sees this situation she steps in and she makes peace i mean this is a great story of peace and the result is, check this out. I mean, the result is there's hundreds of people that are saved. Just a little side note. She goes back home, goes back to her husband, okay? Husband's partying because it's, it's a party. He's drunk like crazy. So she goes, I'm not going to tell him tonight what I did. So he wakes up in the morning. She tells him, hey, I went out to David. I saved us. I saved us. And he's, su he's such a turd, right? He gets so mad. That he has a stroke and he dies 10 days later okay dies 10 days later and then check this out david hears about nabal dying and he's like there's this cute hot chick who's a godsend who saved me she's mine and he marries her and he takes off and the old testament is so cool there's so many stories he also marries another chick which is weird but anyway like there's so many cool stories that you can read about the bible and see the things that we're talking about in action, okay? This woman was a peacemaker in the situation that was outside, wasn't between her 
It was her husband and someone else, but she helped establish peace and helped, listen, helped establish the kingdom of David because had David just destroyed everyone and that sin would be on him, who knows whether his future would have been the same, okay? So, I mean, there's some serious consequences and implications to this young, beautiful woman who had God's discernment to make peace in a situation. We need to be those type of peacemakers. And it's a tri it, listen, it was a tricky situation. And many are, okay? You can't just go sticking your nose in people's business and not expect it to get cut off sometimes, right? This is not about being nosy. This is not about, like, you know, sitting here and you're sitting, oh, I need to be a peacemaker. Oh, yeah, Doug and Jenny, I got to talk to them after service. Oh, Dale, I got to get, I got to hit up him. I got to, like, this is not the idea that you're just looking around. Okay, who do I get to go gossip with now? Like, who do I get to get involved in their business, right? That's not what we're talking about here, okay? Abigail used godly wisdom and discernment, okay? Because a lot of these situations, I mean, they're tricky, tricky situations that they're going to, uh, they're going to take all of the things we talked about, grace and mercy, okay? Wisdom, God's direction to help make peace between two people. So listen, this is not an opportunity for those of you that like to get involved in people's stuff just as a license to, okay, I'm just making peace here and, you know, you know, doing your thing. Be careful what we do with this, okay? We need to be very, very careful of that. And listen, because these Beatitudes build, we said last week that a pure heart was abs it's absolutely necessary for the believer. If you go into trying to make peace with someone or between two people without a pure heart, you're probably going to fail, okay? Pure heart is absolutely a prerequisite because what does a pure heart mean? We talked about that. To be fully and singularly focused on Christ. You're trying to bring Christ into the situation, okay? Not your own ideas, not your own thoughts. You're bringing Christ into that situation. And so these things, like I said, and continue to build and build and build and build on each other. So, what is the B section? Because we're about done and I, I can, can you guys smell that food? It's killing me, man. It's really hard. So anyway, what is the B section? The B section is this, that will be called sons of God. Okay. Now, this is obviously figurative language because the only son of God was who? Jesus. Jesus. Okay. So Jesus Christ was the only one with that title. So if you're trying to pursue that title, oh, it ain't happening. Just letting you know. It's also not a, you're not a physical son because we realize that you're either a son or daughter of who? Your mom and dad, okay? So it's not a physical thing. It's not a title thing. It's truly figurative language. And it's also not, this is not how you become a Christian. Like if, you, if you're a peacemaker, then you get to become one of God's kids. It's not a pre, it's not a way to become a Christian either. None of these beatitudes are a way to become a Christian, right? They're results of our Christian walk. We've talked about that time and time again. These are results of that we've already given our heart to Christ. He's already changing us and making us new from the inside out, okay? It shows that we already are Christians. It's very common the figurative language used in the Bible. Look at Romans chapter 8, uh, verse 14. It says, For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Galatians 3.26, For you're all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. In 1 John 3.10 it says, By this the children of God and the children of the devil. So obviously the devil doesn't have any kids either. Okay, This is figurative. These are people who there's allegiance, their focus, their direction is towards God or Satan. It's through these verses and these beatitudes that we can learn a few things. That, that we can... If we are people that have lived out and continue to live out these beatitudes, if we're realize what our sin is, okay? And we know who we are in Christ. We realize who we are without Him, right? Being spiritually bankrupt. 
If we're repenting of those types of sins, if we're merciful and gentle and deal humbly with people, if we have a singular focus on Christ, which is what we talked about last week, if we try to live like Him and love like Him, then we're going to be peacemakers. And peacemakers are God's kids. This is what, this is what He's saying here. This is what Jesus is saying here. When you're a peacemaker, it's as if... Um, man, I don't know. Let's see. Don, okay? It's as if Don's my son, which is kind of weird here, right? He's an old son, but anyway. It's as if God's saying, that's my boy, right? This is what, this is what that figurative language is. That's my boy right there. That's my boy, Don. It's God coming up and saying, that's my girl, Kylie. Look at her. Look at her go, right? That's my daughter. That's my girl, Darcy. Look at what she did there, making peace. And we all do this. If you've got kids, you do this. You know, my daughter, see my daughter back there, my daughter, Taylor. That's my girl, right? She's legit. You should hear the stories of her sharing her faith with her friends at school. When she's up before me in the morning doing her quiet time and her bing, my phone's binging. Some of yours will bing too because she's doing her quiet time and you're like, dang, that girl's legit. That's my girl, right? And I put my arm around her and I said, that's my girl. I love her. I'm proud of her for doing these things, for being who she is. I'm proud of her when she acts like Jesus. She's got integrity. Jesus... uh, Taylor's so good at school. Like, she's like, like, when I get to talk about her, I, I, I love saying, that's my girl, right? Where's Brody? He ain't even, he's over in King's Kids. He's, I, love, I love saying to people, that's my boy, right? He's got, he's got like my humor, right? When he says things, it's like so funny. It's a lot of times inappropriate, but I love it because it's like, that's my boy, right? I, I love that kid. So funny. He's got this drive in him. Then when he wants to do something, it is his singular focus. He don't get off it. He's like a pit bull on it. You know what I mean? And right now it's like drumming. And I drum. And so I love, that's my boy, right? And when he's playing football and he catches that, you know, long pop, like, that's my boy. That's what God is doing here. When you're a peacemaker, he's like, that's my boy. That's my girl. Look at them. He's proud of us. Maybe that might be a weird word. God's proud of us. I don't know if he can be proud. But anyway, do you understand what I'm saying? That he loves when we're like his son. And he's telling people, that's my boy. That's my girl. And that's what this means. When we're peacemakers, we, we're getting that affirmation from him. We're getting that affirmation. And that ought to be one of our pursuits is to getting that type of affirmation from God, okay? For him to stand up in heaven and say, there's my kid right there. That's my son. That's my girl. Doing it. Getting after it. Being like Jesus. That should be the pursuit of our heart, to please God with the process of us becoming more and more like Jesus. And listen, there's there's really... There's no better person to model your peacemaking after than Jesus, who was the ultimate peacemaker, right? The ultimate peacemaker on our behalf. So I'm going to, I just want to close with us thinking about, okay? Thinking about this idea of peacemaking. Where do you need to make peace in your life? Is it with God, maybe there's people here that don't ha- that don't have a relationship with God. God has made, God has established peace with you. Okay, He's already done it through His Son Jesus. All you need to do is respond to that. Say, I want that peace, Father. I want that peace. I want to be made new in you. Maybe there's some of you that you know someone you need to share the gospel of peace with. Maybe there's someone that you need to make peace with because there's beef between you two. Or maybe there's a situation where you realize there's two people in my life that, man, there needs to be some peace here. And I need to step in, and so I'm going to pray for wisdom and discernment and guidance on how to do that. 
Let's be peacemakers that radically change the relationships around us. All right, if you're